Okay. Hi, everyone. I hope you are well. I'm Yi Xin, co-president of Biosoc. Thank you very much for joining us today for our first session in our series of member-led talks, Summer of Science. Today, we're joined by two speakers, Ella Cathero and Eddie Bowen-Xiao, who are both natural scientists going into their third year of undergraduate studies here at Cambridge. Thank you both for offering to, to share your knowledge with us. I'll be introducing the speakers while Christoph, our co-president, will be moderating the Q&A sessions, which will take place right after each talk. Please post your questions and comments on the Zoom chat or the YouTube live chat throughout the talks. Our first speaker will be Eddie, a neuroscientist uh, and also one of the co-presidents of the John Ray Society at St. Catherine's College. Eddie describes his talk as follows. Both sensory information from external sources and internally, internally generated imaginations would produce memories. How does the brain perform reality monitoring to distinguish between them during recollection and hence construct the reality as we remember it? I will draw from the latest research published by Professor Simon's Cambridge Memory Laboratory and other related sources focusing on anatomical regions of the brain that contribute to reality monitoring, such as the medial anterior prefrontal cortex. This presentation will also co cover studies on the parasingulate sulcus and consider how brain morphology informs the understanding of hallucinations, the positive symptom of schizophrenia related to impairment in reality monitoring. Without further ado, let's now welcome Eddie to deliver his talk. Hi, Eddie, are you ready? Yeah. Okay, um, okay, it seems like there's a bit of technical issues here. Um, no, we can't hear you, Eddie. Um, yeah, in which case, Ella, would you be ready to present your talk? Uh, yes, hold on, give me a quick sec. Yes. Um, yeah, uh, I'll, <laughs> I'll introduce you first uh, okay, while cool. you get ready your slides. Um, so um, Ella is a plant scientist at Newnham College, and she's also one of the co-presidents of the Cambridge Women in Science Society. As Ella says, as well as being interesting for interesting sake, the, the study of chloroplasts and photosynthesis has the capacity to help find the solutions to some of humanity's greatest problems. This short talk will discuss some of the research currently being done into chloroplasts and the possible world-changing impacts. Uh, we shall now welcome Ella to deliver her talk. Cool, I'll just do my screen sharing thing. Da, 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 da. There we go. So, okay, is that all good? Can people see that? Yep. Okay, awesome. Cool. Uh, so thank you everyone for coming. Uh, this is really great. Um, I'm fully intending on just talking about why I find chloroplasts interesting for like 20 to 30 minutes. Um, so I apologize in advance if you find that boring. <laughs> um, but basically, yeah, I think chloroplasts are really, really interesting. I think that they are worth studying. Um, and I will be trying to convince you of that um, over the next about half an hour. Um, just as of evidence for the fact that I, I really like chloroplasts, uh, the, the background of this slide was a photo that was sent to me by my boyfriend about a week after we started dating. Uh, he also gifted me with a, a, a chloroplast bracelet um, for, my first, uh, for the first birthday uh, that we had while I was together. Um, because he knows the way to my heart. <laughs> um, but anyway, so the, 
I can't really remember exactly what it was that originally first sparked my interest in chloroplasts, um, but I know that one of the first things I properly found interesting about them was the endosymbiotic theory, um, which I will summarise now for those of you who um, have basically forgotten all biology since term ended, which is a very relatable position to be in. Um, so, so basically, so the endosymbiotic theory explains the origin of both mitochondria and chloroplasts, but I find the chloroplasts far more interesting, so we're going to be focusing on those, uh, which is basically billions and billions of years ago, you know, before the arise of multicellular life. We happen to have a cell around that has nucleus and mitochondria, it's eukaryotic. Um, and it is heterotrophic, it has to go around trying to find other things um, to eat, basically. It has to go around just nomming stuff. Um, also at the same time, you have cyanobacterium, which had over a lot of evolution time figured out how to do photosynthesis. Um, and this is of benefit to cyanobacteria, because it means they can just find some light and sit in a light and go, aha, I am going to get my food through photosynthesis, which is super helpful. Now on a, I guess, unlucky day for the cyanobacterium, it happens to encounter this heterotrophic cell and promptly is engulfed. I apologize for the terrible diagram. I cannot draw. <laughs> um, but it engulfs it. Now, usually it would have just have been straight up digested because that's what the heterotrophic cell does. Um, but rather than doing that, instead whereas, aha, if I keep you around, this will be of, this will be of aid to me because it means that I will be able to, like you, sit around in the sun and get my food that way, because since the dawn of time, laziness is something that every organism has aspired to. And this led to the cyanobacterium just kind of being kept around. Um, this is obviously, you know, it was also, it wasn't just beneficial to the heterotrophic cell, it was also a benefit to the cyanobacterium, because then got protection, it wasn't, you know, you can't get engulfed again, apart from, you know, secondary endosymbiosis, which is a thing that I'd have to talk about in questions I haven't really gone into in this case. But yeah, it's a very, very beneficial uh, thing. And as a result, you know, we now have chloroplasts in everything from mosses to in you know, this big giant blechnum frond to in the leaves of this rose bush. Um, now, obviously the cyanobacterium never, I guess, intended on becoming, um, on becoming a chloroplast. And so over time has sort of become adjusted to its new role as a chloroplast. And part of that adaptation has involved the transfer of genes from the chloroplast to the nucleus. Um, now we don't quite know why it is that the genes that have moved have moved. We don't really know why this happened at all. Uh, that is sort of part of the research. And this is something that I found particularly interesting. It's what I think properly got me interested. Um, I had this idea of like, oh, hey, wouldn't it be cool if you could move the genes from the nucleus back into the chloroplast so you can make independent chloroplasts? Um, it was then pointed out to me that cyanobacteria still exist today. They're still around. So it would be like a massive waste of resources uh, to spend a lot of time and money moving your genes back. Um, but overall, it kind of, what this shows is that you essentially have an organism within an organism. And that's why I find chloroplasts so interesting is there has to be this range of interactions between the chloroplast and the cell as a whole to make this relationship work, essentially, which I think is pretty cool. And this is quite nicely shown by protein transport. I apologize to any CDB students who did, this may bring up some PTSD in. Um, so basically any protein that is a chloroplast protein that's supposed to be you know, encoded in the chloroplast genome that's been moved to nucleus it is translated on cytosolic ribosomes and is then targeted to the um, targeted to the to the chloroplast um, by a transit peptide. Now, and once it then reaches there, it then has to pass through both the outer and inner chloroplast membranes, which you can see in the diagram um, on the left, because which I nicked from Wikipedia because, as I said, my drawing seals are awful. Now, for it to pass through the outer membrane after it comes in contact, it, it interacts with this protein sort of network called TOC, the translocon of the outer chloroplast membrane. That then allows it; it kind of acts as a channel and allows it transport into the intermembrane space where it's then able to interact with TIC, uh, the translocon of the inner chloroplast membrane. Now, obviously this does show to a certain extent the interaction between um, you know, the chloroplast and cells as a whole. But what I think is even more interesting is when you look at how this process is regulated, which is through the process of chlorad, uh, which stands for chloroplast associated protein degradation. I don't know where the P went. I think the researchers, this is the Jarvis lab at the other university, Oxford. Um, I think they realized that chlorapida would have been a bit of a weird acronym. Um, but it's, it's chloride, which is pretty cool. Um, I was supposed to be working on this over the summer, which is part of the reason why I'm talking about this. I do find it very interesting. Um, and what this process essentially does is it removes the translocons of the outer chloroplast membranes, the top proteins uh, from the outer membrane so that protein transport cannot happen into the chloroplast. Now, the reason a cell might want to possibly slow down protein transport into the chloroplast is if, say, you're a plant and suddenly the salinity in your environment increases massively, or the temperature increases, or there's a drought, or something happens to make living fairly difficult, the main thing you're going to want to do 
is minimize other problems. And one of those problems that you can have is reactive oxygen species generation by your chloroplasts. If you slow down photosynthesis, that's gonna massively lessen that problem for you. Um, and a way of doing that is just slowing down protein transport. So the way they do it is through the ubiquitin protein zone system, which some of you may have heard of, where basically you stick a ubiquitin tag onto your protein and that then causes the protein zone to go, ah, a new target and comes along and degrades it. Um, and that would then you know, slow down your protein transport. So like slightly more detail with this. So on the left of the diagram, you have the uh, chloride apparatus and on the right, you have the TOC sort of complex that you're trying to remove. So the first thing that happens is SP1, which is acting as our ubiquitin ligase in this case, it's the thing that sticks the ubiquitin onto our protein, transfers ubiquitin onto, in this case, top 33, which is one of the subunits, don't worry too much about that. Once the ubiquitin is added, uh, the subunit is then transported out of the outer membrane uh, through SP2, which is a beta barrel protein. It's just like a channel, basically, um, that the protein is able to move through into the cytosol using uh, a proton motor force, not proton motor force, just a motor force that's generated by CDC48, which you can see above. Once out in the cytosol, it still has the ubiquitin tag on it, so then the protein goes, ah, I will degrade you, uh, which then you know, slows down your protein transport. Now, you know, on the face of it, this is just typical biochemistry stuff, it's, you know, protein moves here, protein moves here, protein moves here, that kind of, that kind of thing. Um, but the interesting thing is when you actually step back and think about what this actually means, because the ubiquitin proteasome system, that is an entirely eukaryotic development, that is not something you find in any prokaryotic organism, as far as I'm aware. So you have essentially a eukaryotic system regulating this essentially prokaryotic system. Obviously cyanobacteria are within, not cyanobacteria, chloroplasts are within a eukaryotic cell, but they, are, they, re they retain a lot of prokaryotic features. It then gets even more interesting when you look at the actual apparatus that's conducting you know, the UPS in this case, the SP1, the SP2, the CDC48, particularly with relation to SP2, which is this channel. Um, so SP2 is remarkably similar uh, to a protein called OEP80, which is a member of the OMP85 superfamily of bacterial proteins. And you know, the only thing it's, the only difference between the two is that SP2 is lacking a particular protein domain. And what you find is, is that you know, with this, um, you know, what you essentially have is you have a bacterial protein that has been repurposed to be used in a eukaryotic system to then regulate a prokaryotic system within a eukaryotic system. And I just think that's really cool. Um, and yeah, but obviously, you know, the title of the talk was how chloroplasts will save the world. And so I should probably actually talk about that rather than just going, hey, here's this cool thing chloroplasts do. Um, although I'm more than happy to elaborate on that in questions. <laughs> um, but basically, the two main ways I'm going to talk about with how chloroplasts you know, will possibly help to solve problems that humanity faces currently are possibly they can help to, in, to solve world hunger and also to possibly produce vaccines and biopharmaceuticals, which is really, really cool. So basically the yield of a crop, um, this is the equation for how you calculate it. And there are two of the terms in this equation that relate to how, you know, how, good, your, how good your chloroplast is at functioning. If your chloroplast is able to intercept more light or conduct photosynthesis more efficiently, that is going to mean that you're going to have a higher crop yield, that meaning you'll be able to generate more food. And that is obviously of help um, if you're wanting to feed more people, which is particularly good because you know, currently one in four people across the planet are moder moder moderately or severely food unstable. And it's predicted that, you know, foods, you know, the requirements for food across this planet are going to increase massively as our population continues to grow. So I'm going to look at ways that researchers have thought to increase interception efficiency and then conversion efficiency. So with relation to interception efficiency, uh, the first way that we can talk about is kind of a little bit counterintuitive. Uh, it's decreasing the size of the antennae complexes within a chloroplast. So for those who don't know, or for those who have forgotten, uh, the way that a chloroplast sort of absorbs light as such is in your thylakoid membranes within your chloroplast, you have... Um, a lot you have your photosystems which is where your light dependent reactions happen and then around those you have a space a whole network of pigment molecules so your chlorophylls your xanthophylls carotenoids whatever a plant happens to have and those sit around and they absorb the light that's sort of shining down on them from the sun and then that passes it onto the photosystem through resonance energy transfer such that it's you know the it can empower the light dependent reactions which then generate your atp and nuvh that kind of thing now what you may think is, okay, right, we should increase the size of the antennae because that would mean that it would be able to absorb more light. However, the issue with that is if you have loads of massive antennae, they're all going to shade each other out. And that is going to decrease the amount of light you're actually able to absorb as a, you know, across an entire organism. In this you know, image of a tree uh, that I found on Google, you've got a lot of shading between different leaves. So the thought is if you decrease the size of the antennae, you will decrease this level of shading. So you get much more uniform light absorption and that will also increase the amount of light you can absorb. 
And this works. Um, a, a, a strain of rice is generated that produces 50% less chlorophyll and it had an increased rate of photosynthesis by about 40%, um, which is obviously quite a lot. And that's quite, you know, that's of benefit uh, in terms of increasing crop yield. An alternative method is basically just increasing the amount of light that can actually be absorbed and used for photosynthesis. Um, so as I mentioned, you have these pigments in your antennae complex. Um, the main ones that plants use are chlorophylls A and B. I, I've marked on there sort of the wavelengths at which they absorb uh, the most. You generally photosynthesis is able to use light of wavelengths between 400 and 700 nanometers. Now, obviously, if you could increase that range, you could absorb more light, so you could do more photosynthesis. And one of the possible ways the researchers looked into doing this is expressing new chlorophylls, essentially, that have different peaks. The main ones being D and F, uh, which I've then highlighted because I realized the graph is a little bit of a mess, um, particularly if you're having to look at it quickly and someone is talking at you at the same time. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's thought, it, particularly with chlorophyll F, if you could introduce that in, you could increase the range from 400 to 700 to 400 to 750 nanometers in terms of the wavelengths of light you could absorb. And that would then massively increase, theoretically, your productivity, which is quite cool. An alternative method that's been looked into is completely forgetting the antennae complex and is focusing on the photosystem itself. Uh, so on, on this diagram, this is a diagram of photosystem two, um, uh, which sort of shows you the arrangement of the subunits and also the electron transport that occurs within it. Don't worry about electron transport, that's not what this is about. Instead, we're looking at the subunits. Now, research into various strains of cyanobacteria have found that certain species of cyanobacteria can do a really cool thing with their photosystems where basically they have lots of different versions of these subunits, these CP43, CP47, et cetera. They have lots of different versions of them and they can then chop and change them based on their environment. So it might be that a particular version of D2 you ship in if you're shaded or if it's really hot or something. So as a result, it means that you're able to optimize yourself for the, for the you know, whatever the environment is throwing at you at that given time. So the thought is if you can introduce this into plants, that might then mean that they're able to optimize how they're working, um, which would then increase you know, their ability to do uh, the light dependent reactions, but not necessarily increase light interception. This is all really cool. Um, now, moving on to the conversion efficiency stuff, I can imagine a decent number of people, particularly those who did physiology in first year, will be predicting some of the stuff that I'm about to talk about. But basically, a lot of the conversion efficiency stuff comes down to the fact that one of the enzymes in the light independent reactions, the Calvin cycle, is just a bit shit at its job. Uh, Rubisco is just it's not great it's it's a little bit just not good at its job which i relate to on a personal level but it's um yeah it's a bit of a problem because uh, the thing to remember is you know photosynthesis is what put oxygen in the atmosphere but, you know, when photosynthesis first evolved it wasn't there so all the enzymes that had evolved to be able to catalyze these reactions they weren't used to having all this oxygen present and when the oxygen was there abisco reacted as many humans do to their environment changing which was just ah, i don't want to do my work which again very relatable um, but is a little bit of a problem now because we would like it if it could work slightly better. Um, the reason that Rubisco kind of freaks out around oxygen is it can't tell the difference between oxygen and carbon dioxide. When it comes into contact with carbon dioxide, it does what you can see on the slide. It's supposed to react it with ribulose bisphosphate to form this unstable six carbon intermediate, which then breaks down to form a whole bunch of different compounds. Now, if it reacts with oxygen, it does something completely different that a plant does not want to happen called photorespiration, where it forms a whole bunch of toxic byproducts which the plant has to break down and expend energy doing that and cleaning up Rubisco's mess rather than making the bits of a plant that we like to eat. You know, if you could stop Rubisco from being quite so terrible, then theoretically you would be able, your, your plant could be far more um, sort of productive. So a lot of the ways that people have thought to sort of increase Rubisco's productivity is called, they're called carbon concentrating mechanisms. Um, because the thought is if you can eliminate the oxygen from around the Rubisco, then that's going to be of help. So this is the slide that I feel a lot of people predicted was coming. C4 photosynthesis is um, a really cool concept um, because a lot of plants, I say a lot, a few plants, um, have figured out how to sort of evolve a carbon concentrating mechanism, which is this. Where basically you know, in, in this uh, diagram on the left, uh, you, can see, you can see a comparison between a C3 and a C4 plant. So a C3 plant would be something like rice or potatoes or basically any plant you see outside. Um, and around the vascular bundle, which is this kind of like tube thing down the side, the mesophyll cells just kind of dotted around doing their thing. They're pretty chilled out. Um, whereas if you can know that to the C4 plant, things are like really ordered. You have this like proper arrangement of things around your vascular bundle. And that thing is called a Crown's anatomy. It's arrangement of two cells, um, which you can see in slightly more detail on the right. I will go into more detail with that. And that's kind of going the entire way around your vascular bundle. 
And the difference between you know, the, the special thing about Crohn's anatomy is that what it's doing is it's concentrating the carbon dioxide around your chloroplasts, as it is a carbon concentrating mechanism. And the way it does that is your carbon dioxide comes into your mesophyll cell, which is this top one, where there are no chloroplasts. The CO2 going in there isn't going to come into contact with any rubisco at that point. Rather than being reacted with rubulose bisphosphate, it's reacted with PEP, phosphoenol pyruvate, converted to oxaloacetate, which then converts to malate, which then moves through into the bundle sheath cell where the chloroplasts actually are. The chloroplasts are at the bottom um, of the bundle sheath cell. The malate can then be decarboxylated to release carbon dioxide in the proximity of these chloroplasts, ergo in the proximity of rubisco, therefore meaning that you know, the rubisco has much more carbon dioxide in its proximity. Uh, so the carbon has been concentrated in that area. So there's been a decent amount of interest in trying to engineer this into C3 plants, uh, such as rice, the seaport rice project, for example, is something that is partly being executed within Cambridge by Professor Julian Hibbard. Uh, it's also being done at the other university by Dave Jane Langdale, a variety of universities across the world. Um, it's being funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which I think is quite cool. Um, and the previous attempts to engineer C4 um, photosynthesis into plants has involved just putting like the enzymes, so for example, pet carboxylase, which you can see in the diagram, into rice. And it's found that that doesn't increase the, plant, the ability of a plant to be able to do C4 photosynthesis. You need to have this spatial separation. You need to have the crown's anatomy. So a lot of current research is focusing on trying to find the regulators of that development. Uh, so for example, experiments done by the Langdale Lab in Oxford um, has been looking at maize uh, because they have husk and foliar leaves. Uh, the husk leaves have C3 anatomy, foliar leaves have C4 anatomy. So they're trying to, so they were comparing the transcriptomes of the two to look for positive and neg negative regulators of the crown's anatomy. The main finding of that is it's regulated by a load of different things um, and it's going to be very difficult to engineer because it's very, very polygenic. However, if they could crack it, that would be really, really positive in terms of increasing the ability of a chloroplast function. Now, the eagle-eared, and those of you who haven't completely switched off, may have noticed this is more of a chloroplast location problem than a chloroplast functioning problem. That's where the next one comes in, which is really cool. It's called a pyranoid, uh, which is not a dessert that is worried that you're looking at it too much, as my dad put it. A pyranoid is a carbon concentrating mechanism that is found within algae and hornwort, so early land plants, and some cyanobacteria. Where basically what you do is, is you stick all your rubisco in a particular region of your chloroplast. It's, it's essentially an organelle within an organelle. So you put all your rubisco in this like mini organelle, you surround it with a starch layer, and you then throw carbon dioxide at it. Uh, the way you do that is the thylakoid membranes penetrate into uh, your pyranoid. And then they kind of act as tunnels for things going in and out. Uh, so as you can see in the diagram um, on the right, either carbon dioxide can just sort of diffuse in or use transporters. Alternatively, it can come in in the form of hydrogen carbonate ions, which then are transported into the thylakoid membranes, which transport it along, comes into contact with the carbonic anhydrase, which dehydrates it to release carbon dioxide around your rubisco. Then rubisco does its thing, produces the products, which are then able to move out through a different thylakoid membrane out to you know, rejoin the rest of the Calvin cycle. Now, research is currently being done to see if you can engineer this into the chloroplast of higher plants. I apologize for the sound of my neighbor's car uh, pulling up, um, but you know, they're trying to engineer this into higher plant chloroplasts. Now, there are a few issues that they've run into, namely that so the rubisco in algae are pyroid compatible. They can do this. The ones in higher plants don't really like it, um, if you were going to try and make them like you'd have to engineer the small subunits a little bit and Rubisco doesn't quite like it if you mess around with it, it's a little bit iffy with that, or you'd have to completely substitute it for the algal form of Rubisco, which should be doable, but you know it's still a little bit, it's, it's complicated. Um, the other thing is we, you know, there is, there are differences between algal chloroplasts and higher plant chloroplasts. So we just kind of don't know if they'd go for it from a structural perspective and whether the thylakoid membranes would you know, do this penetration they have to do. Um, but it's still really cool. And obviously it's very, very chloroplast based, which makes me very happy. Um, now, some of you may be thinking, how do you actually introduce any of these edits into chloroplasts? Um, because you know, a lot of the genetic engineering mechanisms that we talk about, things like CRISPR-Cas9, those are very kind of nuclear based. Um, so instead, with chloroplast, you have to do something else, which is basically you take a gene gun and you point it at the chloroplast. And in the gene gun, you have these tungsten microparticles that have DNA coming off of them. And you shoot it at your chloroplast and go, go, be engineered. And the chloroplast goes, OK. It takes the DNA off of the tungsten microparticle that's released when it goes in and it does homologous recombination to put it in. Chloroplasts are quite good at this. They have a, a very high efficiency of HR. Um, and so you can make quite specific edits, which is quite nice. Um, now, obviously, as well as you know, possibly being able to introduce edits that could increase photosynthetic 
productivity. This has also been used for synthetic biology. Uh, so on this slide, you can see some of a table um, that I took from a 2009 paper, which was going into the antigens of biopharmaceuticals that, that have been sort of engineered into chloroplasts. Um, obviously, you can see there's quite a range of them. Um, now, obviously, you know, I'm not going to go into too much detail on any of these particular examples because they're all kind of similar with like, we put the thing in, it produces it, we purify it. The main thing that I want to talk about is why chloroplasts are good for this system, which is namely, it's cheaper. You don't have to sort of ferment a load of bacteria. You can just go, here is a plant. We're going to let it grow. And yeah, you know, that's cheaper. Uh, other, other benefits include that it's far easier to control. Um, you know, chloroplasts are inherited maternally, so you don't have to worry about the chloroplast getting out into the pollen, which is essentially the equivalent of the sperm, so that makes it far easier to control logistically. And the other benefit is chloroplasts are able to do pro-translation modifications, so that gives them sort of, you know, uh, they're better than the E. coli, which can't introduce them. The only one that chloroplasts can't do is glycosylation, so that's pretty good. Um, obviously, vaccines are quite a sexy topic right now, so I thought it made sense to talk about that. Also, vaccines and chloroplasts are quite cool. Uh, so none of them are currently being, uh, no vaccine that's been produced in the chloroplast is yet in circulation, but I would like it to be, because the main benefit is, is you go, right, here, here is my plant. I have engineered it so that the chloroplasts produce the antigen or subunit of my pathogen, or whatever it is that you would usually put in a needle. And then rather than putting it in a needle, you give someone a leaf and they can eat it. And as someone who once went into a fetal position in a dentist chair after being offered anesthetic in a needle, this seems very appealing. I would much rather, you know, if, if it's a choice between this and this, obviously I'm going to take the burger when it comes to vaccination. Now, obviously, everyone should definitely get vaccinated. Needles are not as scary as polio. Um, but I do think that, you know, it's far better just for people like me who are needle phobic. Um, if you could just kind of remove needles from the equation, just go, hey, have this piece of lettuce. That seems much more appealing to me. Now, just kind of try and tie everything together. We've talked about how research into chloroplasts could possibly increase their rate of photosynthesis and hence increase crop yields, and also how you could possibly engineer them to be able to do synthetic biology, you know, to produce drugs and pharmaceuticals and that kind of thing. So I think it makes sense to try and tie this together. Unfortunately, a paper came out mid-May that helps me do that. Um, so research out of the Max Planck Institute of Terrestrial Microbiology um, kind of ties these two things together quite nicely because the researchers there have been able to make artificial chloroplasts. Um, so these dots you can see on the slide, in real life they're about the size of a cell. And what the researchers did was they used microfluidics to make tiny drops of water on top of some oil. And what they then did was they took some thylakoid membranes that they'd mixed from some spinach chloroplasts, stuck them in, as well as some enzymes that they had synthesized earlier, and they were able to get these artificial chloroplasts to use you know, the light from the sun to power a reaction where, they, where it converted carbon dioxide to glycolate. Now this is quite cool um, because theoretically you could put in pretty much any enzyme that you wanted. You could put in things to produce vaccines or biopharmaceuticals or whatever it was that you wanted to produce that could be quite expensive to produce otherwise. They want to kind of use these little mini bioreactors. The other benefit is this could provide quite a good testing ground to see what modifications need to be made to increase the rate of photosynthesis. You could just like, you know, go, okay, right, I'm going to modify this enzyme a little bit, or I'm going to modify this little bit of the antennae and see what effect that has, rather than having to introduce that into a plant and then see what happens with the plant afterwards. It, sort of, it would make it a little bit easier. The other thing, reason why I quite like this paper is these could technically count as independent chloroplasts, which might mean that I was right all those years ago. I really wasn't, but this is a completely different thing, but I was just like, ooh, it's kind of a sad day. Um, but yeah, so thank you very much for listening. I've included on this slide all the music I listened to while preparing this presentation. Uh, thanks to George Greif, who is my boyfriend, uh, for the chloroplast and moss photos, and also listening to this presentation yesterday. And also Tim James for his advice in this presentation. You should go and buy his book. Um, and here are my references. Thank you. Thank you very much for that wonderful, entertaining, and yet very informative presentation, Heather. Does anyone have any questions on the chat, on the live stream chat, or on Zoom? So maybe if I start off, um, regarding the protein engineering of Abisco, I remember yes. faintly that um, the small subunits of Abisco act as a funnel to, well, as a carbon concentrating mechanism in themselves. So why is it not possible to engineer a biscuit to work together with that other physical carbon concentrating mechanism that you mentioned? The, the pyranoids? Yeah. 
So in actuality, that is what you'd have to do. Um, the way that the pyranoid forms is that, um, so you, you take um, your Rubisco and you have a protein called EYPR1, uh, which comes in and binds to the small subunit and basically goes, go, tessellate, and grabs it together in this hexameric conformation. Um, so they think that you could theoretically um, edit, so the, the parts of it that are important are the alpha sub, the two alpha subunits. So it's thought that you could possibly edit those, um, but obviously it is a little bit iffy as to whether you could, because it, it's obviously Rubisco doesn't overly like being engineered, but it could theoretically work. And that is one of the approaches that um, researchers are looking into at the moment to try and see if you could engineer a pyranoid into high plant chloroplasts. Uh, any questions from the live stream or from the group chat? If not, then I might have one more actually. Uh, so, uh, with I, I remember reading about uh, LHCs and antenna complexes, mm -hmm. and I remember that they found relatively recently uh, LHC A, Bs, and I think it was PS twos forming a complex. Have you ha have you heard about those, and what do you think is the significance of that, or is that just an artifact of uh, the method that they were using to try and observe these complexes? Um, so I think it's kind of it's interesting that they form super complexes. Um, I'll be honest, I'm not super familiar with it, um, but I think the, the interesting thing with regards to the antennae complexes is more trying to figure out how to manipulate what's actually within them uh, rather than anything else. Um, because a, a lot of the sort of organisms that are able to do this better have alternative confirmations or you can mess around with it a little bit. Um, and so I think that's probably more what would be worth doing for that. Thank you for that. And Oh, okay. So I think Yixing has a question. So Yixing, would you like to join in? Um, yeah. Um, so like uh, regarding the possibility of uh, engineering antigens and biopharmaceuticals mm -hmm. into chloroplasts mm -hmm. uh, and consuming leaves so that we could avoid being uh, vaccinated. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, how, like, how, is it, how would people Mm, try to overcome the uh, possible problem of um, of the antigens being just digested and broken down in in our stomach and not um, yeah being effective. Thanks. So um, I can't exactly remember how it was um, in the paper that they explained how that happens, but they have found that um, in a lot of organisms, so in mice, for example, you try you do still get the immune response. I'm not entirely sure how, um, but it does work. Um, so in, I, I think there are currently, there's, as of the 2009 paper that I found, there was one vaccine that was in phase two trials, another was in phase three, and a few that were entering into phase one. Um, so I'm not entirely sure how, um, I will get back to you on that. Um, but yes, it's, it does work. All right, yeah. Well, I, I guess, yeah, maybe it's, it's just similar to how we just ingest Mm, yeah, um, yeah, herbs and stuff, and and still enjoy the benefits of those substances, mm. right? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll um pass the floor back to Christoph. Uh, thank you, Ethan. So I think what we'll do now, unless there are any more urgent questions, and then of course, uh, do keep, uh, do keep asking questions on the YouTube live stream and via Zoom. And I'm sure Ella will be happy to answer some more at the end yes. uh, if there are any additional questions. Um, but now I think we should go on to our next speaker, Eddie. Eddie, are you with us? Uh, yes, can you hear me all right? Yeah. Brilliant. Oh, great. No, now it's great. Uh, so I'll be... Uh, apologies for the technical glitch that sort of switched the order a bit. But uh, I think uh, if at any point during the presentation that you cannot hear me, please immediately jump out in the chat and stop me right there. Is that okay? Uh, hi. Uh, can, uh, can anyone hear me at the moment? No, so well, thanks, uh, uh, Christoph and Yixing, and also thanks Ella for 
your uh, talk. Oh, okay. So, uh, well, I, uh, I'll just uh, begin it now. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about uh, comes from uh, the work uh, of the memory lab in Cambridge. So I have been following this lab, uh, uh, which is shown on the map, uh, since my first Mikomas, and I landed myself in an internship there. So the work uh, I helped with over there are very cognitive, so I'm not going to bring them up in the, the biological society. However, I have also been following up their research on uh, cognitive neuroscience, and it is uh, what I've read and heard about those researchers that I would like to present to you today. So it sort of feels like that I have written a very liberally structured and relaxed essay with PowerPoint and have been given the li uh, liberty to talk through it. So if anyone in the audience are interested in doing uh, more of these summer talks, I'm here advertising for uh, President Herke and Neil to urge you to join the course and be the next presenter. So my talk will consist uh, of uh, four main parts. Uh, the first uh, will define reality monitoring and start with uh, simpler cognitive neuroscience results, then move on to compare a more general uh, to uh, introduce a more generalized narrative about how the brain deals with external information, bringing in, uh, in the third part, clinical neuroscience uh, that uh, relates to schizof schizophrenia. Uh, and finally, I will provide some uh, reveries about the causal inferences that we can make about the structures responsible for, for reality monitoring. So to define what uh, reality monitoring is, uh, I'd like to start with something uh, relatable. So, uh, so uh, the excitement about bouts of events. Suppose that yesterday, as a huge fan of Chloroplast, you were so looking forward to Ella's talk that you imagined yourself logging onto Zoom and listening to her talk. Now today, uh, an hour ago, you record what happened yesterday and your brain picked up that vivid and detailed imagination of the bouts of event. And so it will make you think very wrongly that you actually went to the talk already. Well, of course, in this case, uh, Christoph and Yixiong will have, will have saved you from this horrific reality monitoring failure by emailing you to remind you that the event didn't happen just yet. But what if there were no such reminder? How can you tell if the memory that you have uh, retrieved were real, coming from perception and not just from imagination? So this process would be reality monitoring. So there are purely cognitive theories on this, so uh, about how the computation may be done uh, theoretically. And so you can look up the source monitoring framework uh, 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 if, if you're interested. But uh, today I will focus on uh, the neural substrates, i.e. where the regions, uh, where in the brain might these computations be carried out. So to do that, we would first uh, begin with uh, behavioral tasks where we think that they will make the participant perform this computation. So uh, uh, these will be memory tasks. So in the study phase, uh, well, these memory tasks can become in uh, different forms. So this one would be the verbal form. Uh, in the verbal form, in the study phase, you may be presented with sentences that either have the last word missing. So this is the imagined condition. So you would have to imagine like the word car over here, or it will be in the perceived condition. So you actually see the, 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 this word, the boy in the sentence. Now in the test phase, to test your memory, you will be, present, you will be presented with word pairs and so you may be asked to identify whether the, uh, the word you see uh, over here, the underlying word, were imagined or were they actually perceived. So uh, this could also be uh, visual. So for instance, uh, it, uh, when you see a, a chair over here, you would have to, you may, it, it may either be in the perceived condition, uh, actually move to the corner, or you'll be instructed to imagine it uh, uh, move to the corner as the cross moves to the corner. So, there are a lot of tests uh, of this nature and they're often paired with other memory tasks. So a review done by uh, Professor, uh, uh, Professor Simons uh, sh uh, show, uh, show that most of them found uh, re uh, regions uh, in this uh, medial anterior prefrontal cortex over here uh, as shown on the graph. So uh, you will be inclined to ask at the moment, so what does this really tell us? Uh, where does all these classical like parts of the brain lights up studies really uh, mean. So to put it in a bigger narrative, and if you are an intelligent mathematician, you may go into the field of computational neuroscience and be like uh, this fellow Gershman over here. 
So he compared the brain to a generative adversarial network, apparently a very popular thing in the neural network where uh, people can actually generate images that look very real. So sadly, I am not a, I am not a mathematician and nor am I intelligent. So I really appreciate input from people in the audience who are more trained on this matter. But what I can actually take away from this, uh, this uh, uh, Gershman's idea is the concept that is this uh, more posterior regions that are act as generators. So uh, they will uh, process the information from our sensory organs, but they would also have activity that do not represent what actually goes on. So, uh, mem uh, so memories of your imaginations would also be included in these, uh, would also be generated by these generators. So the goal of the prefrontal discriminator uh, would, uh, would be to tell which part of these generated information are real and what part of them are not. And the discrimination would form your mental experience. So I think it would be most inspiring to talk about this somewhat abstract model further in the context of schizophrenia. So uh, also known as psychosis. So this uh, moves on to the realm of clinical neuroscience. And uh, it seems that a prominent uh, positive symptom of schizophrenia is hallucination. Uh, so defined as false perception. So they're often auditory ones or, uh, and uh, often uh, language based. So there are two things that were brought to the attention uh, of the uh, memory lab. And uh, you see why they are very, very uh, you see why they're super interesting. So not all patients uh, uh, would experience hallucinations. But furthermore, not all who experience, who experience hallucinations are patients. So they, uh, there are a lot of non-clinical uh, uh, hallucinations, people who experience hallucinations, but they are not diagnosed and uh, often they, fun uh, they uh, function uh, normally in life. So this uh, would be uh, to, to understand the biological uh, substrates behind this distinction uh, it's best to bring out the parasingulate sulcus. So uh, in line with the previous studies I mentioned, uh, the parasingulate sulcus is a medial structure buried between the longitudinal fissure that separates our two hemispheres. So this is a place that streams that are very special because uh, it's one of the uh, folds that appear very late in development and only humans and chimpanzees uh, have been found to have this uh, sulcus. So uh, uh, what the, the studies done by uh, the memory lab were that uh, in patients, so referring back to the, these problems, in patients uh, with, uh, so in patients uh, with hallucinations and patients uh, without hallucinations, it seems that there's a, uh, there's a difference in their parasingular sulcus length, length. But more importantly, uh, well, the length, differ from controls, but there was, this, there was no significant length difference between controls with the people who have no hallucinations. And to further this result, uh, it, uh, when comparing between uh, clinical and non-clinical hallucinators, it seems that uh, the non-clinical hallucinators would have a, a parasingulate length, a parasingulate sulcus length that's similar to the controls, but uh, it's only the people who have clinical hallucinations that would have a reduced, significantly reduced length uh, in, uh, in the parasingular sulcus. So eventually this, uh, well, oh, so I probably should also tie this to the reality monitoring task I've been mentioning about. So an even earlier study uh, done in 2001 has found that actually uh, for people who have a bilateral absence of parasingular sulcus, their reality monitoring performance on the y-axis uh, would be significantly uh, poorer than the uh, other uh, conditions. So this sort of ties back to the story, uh, uh, the Gershman's model of the generative adversarial network. So in that, uh, well, so it's summarized uh, by this picture in from this uh, 2019 paper that people with uh, hyperactivity in their sensory regions they may experience hallucinations, but it would only, uh, but only with a dysfunction also in the medial uh, prefrontal cortex regions, for instance, uh, that that re that's, that relates to the parasingulate so-called length uh, deficiencies that would cause a person to have clinical hallucinations. So uh, before we move on, uh, just just uh, we need to uh, we just need to think about what 
the uh, so-called length actually reflects because um, this, uh, well, this is a little bit further deviation into the mechanics of all. Uh, so the expansion of uh, different brain regions, more specifically the tangential expansion, uh, they would uh, create a pressure in different regions that would cause uh, other regions with different subtle architecture to buckle and fold up. So uh, there may be some fundamental structural differences in the cortices uh, yet to be discovered that would actually underlie the parasingular so-called length uh, diversity. Uh, so at the end of the day, uh, it's another vital thing to do would be to make uh, causal inferences. Uh, so as you would have noticed, all the previous methods have been about observations. So between different populations or between different uh, activities that a person would do. And it'd be nice to further apply interventions on the brain uh, in the, like the medial PFC regions and assess the functional outcomes. So to start with methods like uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation uh, or like uh, other chemical or electric means, they will provide external stimulations to the brain. However, uh, those, uh, it, it's, it's, they're currently not very feasible for the uh, uh, regions of interest uh, in, of the memory lab because of the anatomy. But what if there's a way to tell subjects to internally upregulate the cortical activity. So uh, with, their, uh, with their own like mental efforts. So what has been done to do this inter uh, internal stimulation is uh, some, uh, uh, a method that some might call magic, uh, the fMRI neurofeedback. So FYI, this is, a, uh, this is uh, now moving on to information from a preprint that hasn't been peer reviewed yet, but it's on the memory labs website. So what they did was that they put uh, participants in, uh, FMI, uh, in MRI, MRI scanners, and they would ask them to try and make this thermometer, thermometer they see on the screen. Uh, they want them to make the reading go up. So in, this so, uh, so in the so-called active feedback group, so the experiment group, the thermometer is not measuring the ambient temperature at all. It's measuring the bold signal, the uh, blood oxygen level signal, uh, Acquired from this predetermined uh, vo vo these predetermined voxels of interest uh, outlined in red over here. So if the activity uh, in these regions uh, uh, go up, so would the thermometer. So uh, to put it, uh, so, so uh, uh, they will also have uh, sham control groups where the uh, movement of the thermometer would be uh, relatively random and just matching up in size with those in the active group. So uh, what they have reported in this preprint was that uh, the, they seem to have, uh, so after this kind of training in neurofeedback, what, uh, uh, similar to chemical or electric uh, stimulations of the, uh, these predetermined regions, they would have an improved accuracy in identifying what items are imagined but they will not have uh, they will not uh, have that much of an improvement in, for instance, recognition memory. So this is uh, very interesting in that they it sort of points to uh, clinical implications, like just like uh, well methods like transcranial magnetic simulation, they have been used to improve functions of the brain in like stroke patients. So neurofeedback could be a promising field where the users can, up, uh, can regulate their own uh, brain activity and improve their functions. So to summarize, I have brought you from the reality monitoring task, the behavioral task, to the functional imaging results that pointed out uh, medial anterior involvements, and, uh, and also uh, to, uh, to the uh, more uh, theoretical framework of discriminators and generators. So uh, this uh, maps on to, uh, for instance, morphology uh, diversity in the parasingulate sulcus and how that would relate to uh, uh, clinical hallucinations. So finally, these uh, fMRI neurofeedback, they may have translatable outcomes. So I hope you have enjoyed our uh, uh, little tour uh, at the Summer Talk of Science and are in a mood of discussion. So uh, thank you very much for listening and uh, thank you for participating. I will be stopping my sharing now.
Eddie thank you very much for that it's a very informative talk as always and perhaps on a side note uh, Eddie will be starting uh, neurobiology and neuroscience as well as experimental psychology based um, study slash journal club and of course we'll follow up with the details on that later um, maybe I'll start off with a question from my own uh, of my own. Uh, you mentioned neurofeedback, and it reminds me of uh, 1960s experiments with uh, single cell experiments with trying to elicit a certain response in experimenting with brain machine interfaces. So how, how widely applied has fMRI neurofeedback been? Or is this a relatively new technique? So from what I read, uh, according to the introduction parts of those papers I read, it seems that uh, it's still dubious as an experimental technique. So they have to have a lot of justifications for it. But I, uh, I, I'm not sure how widely applied it is uh, like clinically like out there because, well, I, 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 but I do know that uh, there are already products out there that are using uh, uh, EEG because it's much more portable that are doing the neurofeedback work. It's great to hear that there's been work done in that area and EEG and neurofeedback as well. Um, do you have any more questions from uh, the live stream or the Zoom chat? I think Yixing um, has just... Yeah, yeah, I actually have one question. Um, yeah, so I didn't quite catch the, the contents of the last few slides. Um, so yeah, Eddie, would you mind uh, explaining what sham actually means and, or if you if you could um, perhaps go back to the few slides. And... Uh, so, uh, uh, everything displaying all right? So I- um, Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, here are my references. I think if anyone's interested in catching them. So uh, back to the part of, uh, you mean the, the, this part? Um, yeah, and, and what does uh, SHAM actually stand for? Uh, so uh, unfortunately I do not have a slide for the actual process, but uh, it's essentially that they are having uh, two groups, the like one is the, where they actually receive the feedback and the SHAM group is the control group where they, uh, do not, re do not receive this kind of training. So uh, the, the SHAM group over here, what they have is that they also, they also put in the scanners. They also have the thermometer, they have the exact same instructions, but instead of uh, having to, uh, instead of uh, actually being able to use their brain activity to move the thermometer up, what's been, the information fed into the thermometer are actually fake signals. So these fake signals are not just complete, not completely random. They were matched up in size with what you would have expected from the, uh, the active group, but they are still nonetheless, nonetheless not correlated with this. So this provides a good control comparison to make sure that it's actually because they are uh, doing, uh, well, putting uh, effort into this region that changes their uh, active uh, performance rather than because they were just sitting there and playing with this fancy technique. So I hope that answers the question. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, are there any more questions uh, for Eddie on the group chat or the live stream? If not, maybe if I can just ask one more question for Eddie. Um, why do you think there is uh, such a difference between uh, the passing late cell of slents for uh, clinical and non-clinical hallucinations? Uh, you mean, uh, so uh, it's, be, uh, so because the, the issue is that, oh, I'll probably refer back to the slide. Uh, over here is that they do not, yeah. Uh, so uh, p uh, people in the clinical groups, they will have the dysfunction, uh, the parasingulate, uh, uh, well, uh, uh, hypothetically, they, they will probably have some uh, dysfunction in the medial anterior PFC and that's reflected in the parasingulate sulcus. So people in non-clinical groups, they will experience sensory hyperactivity and that's why they report hallucinatory experiences. 
but because they have no dysfunction in uh, medial anterior uh, prefrontal co cortex, uh, their reality monitoring system would be uh, as written here intact. So they will uh, they will know that uh, those are hallucinations, and they may not be troubled by it. Uh, to put uh, to put well simply. Uh, thank you for referring back to that and for clarifying. Um, if we actually have a question for Ella on the live stream, so I'll just read that out. Thank you, Ella and Eddie for two really interesting talks. A question for Ella. Is CRISPR not used to modify chloroplast genomes or like mitochondria, have they run into problems doing this? If that's the case, do you think that the development of CRISPR technology uh, that would work in chloroplasts would be revolutionary, or is the gene gun technology perfectly suitable uh, for creating all of the exciting advancements you mentioned? That's a really, really good question. Um, so obviously, I think the, the thing with CRISPR-Cas9 is obviously to actually introduce it into a cell, you either need to introduce the protein and then the guide RNA or any um, sort of templates you want to use for HR by itself, now, the issue you have with that is you can't get mRNA into a chloroplast. That's not a thing that can happen. So that is a little bit of a non-starter. And then if you wanted to, um, or essentially you can encode everything on a plasmid and then get that in. The issue is, is, again, you can't get any nucleotides into a chloroplast. So realistically, you would probably struggle to do it. Um, you know, I, I, I personally think it would, you would struggle. Obviously, if you could get it to work, that would be really great. You probably need to find a way to get new transporters and stuff into the outer membrane of the, of the chloroplast, which might be possible, um, but I'm not entirely sure. Um, so I, I think obviously the benefit is, is that the homologous recombination efficiency in chloroplasts is really, really high. Um, so you may struggle to maybe sort of engineer specific genes because you'd have to kind of, you'd have to find, because obviously with homologous recombination, you're putting in a whole new sequence. Um, so you could theoretically do um, like specific edits, but it would be far easier to just go, right, we're going to chuck a completely new gene in as I sort of went through with synthetic biology. Um, but fortunately, you know, as I said, chloroplasts have a very high efficiency of molecular recombination. So at the moment, it's enough. If, if you could do CRISPR-Cas9 in chloroplasts, that could be really, really cool. Equally, if you could find some other way to kind of do the same thing as CRISPR in chloroplasts, that would be really nice. Although I can't off the top of my head think of a way you could do that. Um, but yeah, that's kind of what my opinion is on that. Be yeah, a really good question. Thank you for that answer and for that question. Perhaps there'd be a way of using uh, fusion nucleases from one system and mm. restriction enzymes from another. Um, I, I think that's something similar has been done, but mm. in, perhaps in general, not, but not in the yeah. class. Uh, but I think on that note, unless there are any more questions, I think we'll probably wrap up. And of course, thank you so much to both of our wonderful speakers for very entertaining and informative talks. Uh, thank you to everyone who uh, contributed in any way possible by attending or by asking a question. Um, just a reminder that we will have another talk on Wednesday on virology from rotaviruses to COVID-19. We will also have another Summer of Science talk uh, with two PhD researchers. Uh, we will publicize that shortly, but it will be next, not this Friday, not the coming Friday, next Friday. But in the meantime, thank you so much. Do subscribe to keep up with our talks and events, like our Facebook page, uh, follow us on Twitter, at Cambridge Biosoc, of course. But I know this sounds uh, a lot like a terrible YouTuber. So I'll, without any further ado, thank you so much for coming and we'll see you shortly, hopefully. <laughs>